What's going on, everybody? We're here. We're live. Welcome to a brand new Poker Live podcast. My name is Sean. Good morning, Kish. Joey, coming to you from Las Vegas, Nevada still. I'm never leaving this town. A little update in the podcast. A couple days ago, we had on Bill Perkins, a late night. Grab your whiskey, grab your girl, grab your glass of wine podcast. It was a great podcast. This Wednesday, or this Friday, rather, we're having Kelly Winterhalter back on the podcast. Kelly is, I think she's going to start really dedicating herself full-time to poker. We're going to talk more about that, talk more about her business and the World Series of Poker for herself. Next Wednesday, Big Brother champion, Streamboat participant, and all around one of my favorite guys to chat with, Kevin Martin, will be back on the podcast. And we're also going to be having Pratush Bodigan, not sure on the day, but that should be next week. PLP, joining us today on the podcast is a young man who must have made $35 million during the World Series of Poker this year from taking people's money when they bet against certain players on poker shares. A man who's been going hard on the Twitter streets. A man who may be trying to go hard on the Conor McGregor, Floyd Mayweather fight coming up here soon. A man who we're going to find out how much Bitcoin does the guy got. Does he got a, a $25 million in cryptocurrency? Where does he stand in this situation? A man who Haralla Bob Vulgaris said on Twitter recently, he cannot wait to hear more from Mike McDonald. That's right. Mike McDonald, a.k.a. Timex, back on the podcast. What's up, Poppy? Yeah, it's, it's, it's good to talk to you. Yeah, it's good to be back on the podcast. And your, your introductions just keep getting better and better. Like last time I was on here, I felt like you said all that could possibly – everything positive that could possibly be said about me and here you just went and outdid yourself like it's it's always if i ever need uh, a confidence boost i've just got to hear the joe ingram uh, introduction well well it's good to be Listen, back my I, if anyone out there ever needs a confidence boost when they need an introduction about themselves get in touch with me let me know on instagram twitter snapchat youtube wherever i will be happy to give you 20 to 10 depends on what your intro is 10 to 30 seconds and get you boosted up in the morning. You listen to it each morning time. You can buy those for 99 cents and I'll, I'll boost up your spirits each morning in the day if you want. So that's my offer to people out there. Mike, what do you think about that? GTO or no? Very, very GTO, you know, if uh, I'm like, my friends are always talking about what are we gonna do post poker? And you know, you could be just like uh, everybody sort of like hype man, personal motivator, like, you know, get you, get you up and happy in the morning. Like, I think, I think that, could, that could be your calling. Yeah, I mean, it could be my calling. I don't know. I think I, I, Bob Balky actually says, you forgot Tree Lover. You're right. I did forget Tree Lover. We know Mike McDonald is a man who enjoys some trees. So, But Mike, what's been, happening? <laughs> what, what's been happening with you, Mike? I seen you up there in Canada. I saw Fedor showed up at some point in time. I'm not even sure what happened there. I saw you've been hiking on the mountains. You've been been obviously advertising poker shares a lot, working hard with that. What's been going on these past uh, couple months here? Yeah, so um, uh, my friend Aaron Jones and I bought a place out in uh, just outside of Banff, Alberta, uh, in the mountains, uh, about three, four months ago. Been spending a lot of my time up here. Uh, I did a couple trips down to Vegas this summer. Been doing a lot of hiking, decent amount of golfing. Just yeah, just kind of uh, a much more relaxed summer than the people who who played fifty events or something. And then, of course, obviously, my my time. You know when I'm when I'm not you know when I'm not outdoors or whatnot is largely spent on poker shares. Uh, it's a pretty it's a pretty interesting transition to go from uh, to go from kind of do what you want when you want and kind of have no obligations playing poker to actually running a business where there's just you know an endless list of things you can do to improve things. Like there's you know there's only so many hours in the day and you've kind of got to prioritize where there's certain optimizations you could make that you don't necessarily have the time for or whatnot. It's a very, it's a very different thing. And I feel like I'm constantly being challenged doing this, which I really enjoy. Yeah, that's the biggest thing I noticed about kind of you know, transitioning away from poker and working more on a business or more on content or more on an audience is that I felt like with poker, it's kind of simple. You, in a lot of ways, you sit down, you play poker. Obviously there's the study aspect of things, you talk poker, but for the most part, you just sit down and play. Yeah. Whereas with any of the other stuff, there is like infinite number of options, whether it's you want to add this in, you want to you want to hire this person to do this, you want to write more about this, you want to create more about this. There's literally infinite number of options. I think in a way that's what kind of makes it a challenge too for me is that I'm, I'm sure the prize for you is you're just not used to having all these little places you can go. It's just like with poker, you know, you sort of show up, you play poker and you mm -hmm. play online, you play poker. It just it, it's very basic and very easy, not necessarily easy to beat the game, but kind of easy to do. 
Yeah, no, that's very true. And even as poker players, a lot of the things away from the table, we don't necessarily optimize. Like I know in, when in your recent podcast with Bill Perkins, he was talking about how a lot of these pros, they're never going to get into the good live games. If you spend more time focusing on, you know, random networking and schmoozing and stuff and trying to get into the best games, that's going to be, you know, likely more profitable than a couple extra hours spent with uh, spent on PO Solver or, you know, moving to a softer site or, you know, making sure that you have rake back or whatever it happens to be. Even a lot of those things that actually help your bottom line a lot, most of us have kind of neglected. And now when running a business, there's so many optimizations you can make. Like every every day we learn like 10 new things that we're doing wrong kind of thing. And it's it's pretty it's pretty interesting where if you're just sort of like, uh, if you're like a critical person and you're, you know, can be a bit of a perfectionist, there's a lot of, there's just constant room for improvements. Like I, I see how so many businesses, you know, they kind of subscribe to this, if like, if it ain't broke, don't fix it kind of mentality. But, you know, if you're, like there's always something better that can be done. And I think it's, you know, if, you know, becoming complacent can just be so detrimental. So, you know, just constantly looking for uh, new improvements and ways to uh, improve our product and the experience associated with it. So at what point in time does it become, let's focus on what we have built up right here and try to make that as great as we can, instead of let's think about these new things we could potentially work on or potentially add in. Um, I mean, so again, I'm not, I'm not a particular, I'm not like a, uh, you know, seasoned business person with, you know, careers, like, you know, decades of experience in many industries. Like my mentality is sort of always work on focusing on things. Like, I don't think, you know, I think that you, you obviously need some degree of life balance, but I think that I think sort of the, the decision to, you know, sort of consciously run your business worth worse should only really be done at the at sort of the cost of making other aspects of your life better. Kind of. Like if you're, if you're not trying to improve your, if at any stage in your business, you're like, okay, it's good enough. The reason you should be saying it's good enough isn't because it's actually good enough. It's because making it better is, takes up enough of your time that it takes away more from your life than it adds to your life kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I think that, you know, I think that, I think with, with everybody, you know, it's like, uh, you know, like just a couple of days ago, like, uh, you know, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the name. Jeff Bezos is uh, became the richest guy in the world with Amazon. Uh, he basically, you know, there's still a million things he could be doing better. Like, you know, it's not as if, all right, you know, he he t like he, you know, Amazon uh, is now ahead of Microsoft. All right, now you just chill and go, you know, go just live on your island or something. Like, there's there's always room to do something better, and especially when you do something that you think is, you know, is providing content or you know giving people an experience or making people's lives better uh it's you know there's there's kind of no there's no need to just stop even if you've had enough success that you're happy with it like we we love the fact that and we didn't even realize this would happen that a lot of people who don't really play poker anymore as their form of entertainment like their night's entertainment is just you know buy pieces of a couple guys in online tournaments and just like you know have a couple beers throw it up like kind of you know maybe watch a twitch streamer while watching two two guys that they bet on and stuff and we we never even like we assumed that almost everyone who'd be using our platform would be would be people who are you know playing poker themselves or very into the community but there are there are plenty of people who don't even play poker anymore who still routinely use our site and you're like we're just kind of like you know we just invented a form of entertainment which is kind of cool no, I think that's uh, that's something I never. I didn't think that. I didn't think about that at all. Uh, I find that interesting because I, I yeah, like I talk with a lot of people out there who love poker and they would follow poker if there was like something to follow. Whether it's Doug Polk's maybe news videos, like they're not really interested in the strategy of the hands and they're not really interested in playing themselves anymore. But they still love poker. They loved it at one point in time and they still want to follow along with it. And it's kind of it makes sense why people would. It's kind of like DFS in a way that they get to watch some poker, they get to bet on someone they might be watching on a stream, and they potentially get to make some money. Now, how much money they're making or not, I'm not sure. I got a time mix, listen, my biggest takeaway from Vegas outside of that, if you're a girl or your boy, come to Las Vegas, pray to God, because they're getting on the line as fuck. But my biggest takeaway is that <laughs> if you own a casino, if you own a sports book, if you own an arcade, you're probably doing pretty well. <laughs> and I love the inclusion of arcade into that. <laughs> I mean, you got it. It's got to probably be going pretty well. I, I mean, 
it's going pretty decently. Yeah, pretty. I'm uh, I'm happy with things. There's still a lot of ways it could be going a lot better, but you know, I'm uh, I'm happy with it so far. Yeah, everybody in the chat, guys. I appreciate everybody tuning in live today. We're back on the podcast, crying. A lot of people in the chat, Mike. These guys. I've never seen a group of people more obsessed with cryptocurrency. Now, I don't know why they insist on hearing from poker players on what, what poker players think about cryptocurrency, but because it's the big buzzword right now, because everybody's talking about it with the hard fork and the soft fork and the hard spoon coming up here, where do you, where do you stand on cryptocurrency, Mike? Uh, I stand pretty positively on cryptocurrency. I think that, uh, I think that you know cryptocurrency and blockchain technology really has the power to just revolutionize the world. Um, I think there's a big disconnect right now. Like there's there's kind of the, you know, what's really going on. And then there's what people idealistically have in their heads um, as far as, you know, what, you know, as far as how, as far as how money works now, as far as the power that government authorities have versus, you know, you know, true decentralization, no governing body. Like people think we can get from here to here quicker than we actually can, I think. But I think it's, you know, it might take it might take 25 years when people think it's going to be two years or something like that. But I think that I think that this technology is really uh, it's going to be it's I think it's going to be even, you know, just bigger than bigger than just currency. Like I think even, you know, as far as this whole uh, you know, voting tech, voting technology. Like I think, I think within our lifetime, it could easily get to the point that, you know, you don't even need a president if you can just have real time voting on all issues while they're going on, basically, you know, the idea that you can, you know, your whole monetary system is effectively being voted on every 10 minutes to determine if you have your money and if you don't. And now there's, you know, now there's, what is it? Uh, 12 figures of cryptocurrency that basically is just, you know, the miners vote on whether it's your money or not. And this 12 figures is being, is being held. Like the idea that a, the idea that a country could be run by consensus, I think could easily be done. And, you know, you know, elections wouldn't be necessary. Slow government policy wouldn't be necessary. I think the, I think that this goes almost bigger than economics as far as uh, the implications that are somewhat related to this. Yeah, I mean, I'm still kind of learning about this stuff, Mike. I've been reading some good articles lately and trying, I've been trying to find the Doug Polk and like the me of cryptocurrency so I can like watch their shit and learn about this stuff from all the people that are in that industry because it, it feels like it's also so Chinese to me at this point in time. And I think a lot of people out there, they feel the same way. And it seems like now people are starting to get that little bit of knowledge to the point where they become a little dangerous for other people or dangerous for themselves. And I don't know, but it does seem like a lot of poker players I know have a lot of money invested in there. They may have invested it back, you know, a couple of years back, and now that's ballooned into a massive amount of money. In terms of your own personal investment in it, where do you stand with that? Um, so I have some money in that. Um, it's like not. Uh, I'm not one of those guys who's all in on it. I'm not one of those guys who's you know completely avoided it. Like I'm, you know, I, I have a lot of faith in it, and I'm the type of person when I, you know, when I think something is. Uh, when I, when I, you know, when I believe something is the case, I'm usually willing to put my uh, money where my mouth is. You know, if I think you can swim a mile, I'm willing to, I'm willing to bet my 5k on it. Uh, you know, I'm very, you know, I, that might be the worst bet I ever make, but you know, it's, it's definitely just one of those things where, you know, I, I'm not someone who's going to preach uh, something that I don't believe in. Um, the one thing I will say about cryptocurrencies that you, I completely agree with is it's, it does have um, some dangerous elements to it. So, like, what what I'll say is there's there's I'll, I'll split kind of the cr cryptocurrency into two components. I'll put, split it into the the investment component and the um, the innovation component, basically. And you know, I'm I'm a big believer in the innovation component. Like, I believe that this is something that is going to change the world. And then the investment component, like, I mean, Bitcoin, like where we're at right now. It's conceivable Bitcoin should be worth one dollar or something. Like I have, I have no idea. Um, but I think what ends up really happening is everyone who's invested in this is incentivized to get other people to invest in it as well. So I think people are constantly blurring the lines between their belief in the innovation component with their belief in the uh, investment component. And I think it was uh, I listened to I've listened to probably you know 
couple dozen podcasts in the last few weeks, but I think this is one with uh, Naval Ravikant, uh, I might have pronounced that wrong, where he basically said that cryptocurrency, like despite all the positive qualities about them, it, uh, it works kind of like a Ponzi scheme where the higher levels on the Ponzi scheme are just like the smarter uh, and more innovative and more uh, early adopters of it. So, you know, in like some, whatever, seven years ago, you have a few guys using Bitcoin and all those guys are extremely tech savvy people. They understand the technology, you know, inside and out and they kind of got started with this. And then they sort of told some of their, you know, maybe slightly less technically savvy friends, maybe some of their friends in the startup world, maybe some people who are just like, you know, like the idea of investing, maybe don't fully understand the technology. And then they got in and then they made some money. And now those people can kind of be like, okay, well, we made some money. We can tell some of my friends that look up to me, you know, some of the people that saw I turned a hundred bucks into 10,000, a few people who have even less and less of an understanding for it. And it's kind of branched its way down to where so few people really, really understand, you know, the ins and the outs of cryptocurrency. And we're, you know, I'd say the poker community for the most part, myself included, are really, are really selling something largely because it's made us money rather than because we intrinsically understand it. So I think, I think that's something that people need to be careful of. And that's one of the reasons that I haven't gotten so heavily invested because while I believe that this is something like someday going to be a thing, I have no idea whether the current market cap should be you know, a hundred billion, 10 trillion or 10 million. <laughs> like it's, it's really, you know, there's so, there's so, you can have so little confidence in this stuff that I think a lot, yeah, I think when, when what you said about it being dangerous is uh, very true. Yeah. That's kind of something about the last night was that if you invested in Bitcoin or Ethereum or any of the other cryptocurrencies, it seems like you have a pretty large incentive to get as many other people to believe in that too, as you can whether that's through a podcast or through social media like Twitter or on a Facebook. And yeah, I mean, a lot of people just don't understand it at all. It's sort of like, I'm just getting in there because Doug Polk said to get in there. I'm getting in there because, you know, I follow Ryan Dodd on Twitter and Ryan Dodd talked about getting in this stuff years ago and now he's made a lot of money. So now we want to try to make a lot of money too. So yeah, I mean, I, and that's kind of, I feel like the step I'm at now where I'm trying to learn more about it before I put, in, put a lot of money into it. I guess I got some just to get some, why not? But that seems like a, a fishy, fishy logic right there. You know, I'm just invested in it because a lot of my friends are, or other people I know are. So I guess that's the next step is education. Yeah, I, I, I mean, the one thing that I will say is that, uh, you know, the, it's the level of expertise needed to truly make any investment with confidence is a lot higher than than people would, would like to advocate. Like, you know, let's just say even buying... Uh, you know, a, like a, you like a United States bond or something like that. It's just that's got to be one of the you know safest, most stable investments there are. But you still like you know before doing that, it's not as if you go over like the balance sheet for the whole United States. It's not as if you analyze all their industries, analyze you know your chance of going to war, analyze that you know the chances that the U.S. like defaults. Like you're not you're not thinking about this sort of stuff when really, you know, to truly be an expert and to truly understand it, you know, you might need like, uh, you know, a, ha a handful of degrees and a handful of, you know, you know, insanely strong uh, connections that are, you know, and that's just to make your like, whatever, two and a half percent a year or something. So I guess, I guess what I, my point is, is that to make, to make an investment with an amount of money that you're comfortable losing, I don't think you necessarily need the to know the ins and the outs so it's it's a fine line between it's scary to invest too much it's scary to just you know invest in something purely because other people have made money in it but at the same time you know mo even even like simpler or stabler investments can be very complex as well well now now i don't want to invest anymore in anything now when you think about it more <laughs> like that. I, I feel like i feel like when i do something i, I want to at least Except this dumbass profit I made recently. I kind of like to have a pretty good idea of, of what I'm doing with my money if I put it into something. Whether that's pop the Noma, whether that's I'm going to burn it at roulette, whether it's I'm going to spend money potentially at a nightclub, whether if I'm going to spend money on a on a, on a, on a, on a woman. I don't know, like, who knows what I'm going to be <laughs> buying something for? Like I want to know exactly what I'm getting for my investment a lot of times. So absolutely.
<laughs> uh, yeah, people in the chat say, am I wearing lenses or am I high right now? No, I am not high. I woke up about an hour ago. I'm probably pretty tired and that's what you see in my eyes. And plus there's like the natural lights in this little room in here. So, but yeah, and weed is definitely legal in Vegas guys. And, uh, but no, I have not. You were, you were down here for World Series Poker for a little bit. Mike, did you, what did you play down here? Uh, the main event. Main event, that how'd that uh, I busted it end of day one. It was honestly, it was honestly kind of a perfect outcome, <laughs> if that makes sense, where, you know, I, I guess I, you know, I think I played very well, ran really hot in my decision making, and basically just sort of, sort of guessed right every hand I played, and just you know I was I had I basically had just had one of those days where I was kind of destined to you know lose 150,000 chips and was pretty lucky to only lose 50,000 chips kind of thing. So, so there were, and I didn't get far enough to be disappointed or anything. So you know short of short of actually you know, final tabling, this is probably emotionally one of the best outcomes, I suppose. Did, did you, okay, did you spend a lot of time, you know, I gotta say it was actually a good emotional outcome for me when I missed the, reg, missed the men event registration and then I went, ended up being out till, at Spearmint Rhino until 10.30 a.m. that morning. So that was a, a, a positive emotional, a positive emotional experience for myself as well too. So it sounds like we both had pretty good main event experiences. Exactly. Your, yours might have been a little better than mine. Uh, hopefully less costly than mine, but you never you never know. I don't know how hard you get on the grind. Oh, man. Did you did you hang out with any people down here, Mike? Were you, were you seeing some people? Did you set up any meetings? Did you have any sort of uh, any sort of things like that go, go down here? Yeah. Um, uh, basically, my time in Vegas was pretty uh, business related, I guess. Um, so I had, yeah, I had a bunch of different meetings with a bunch of different people. Uh, it's kind of nice how many how many people from the poker industry all end up in Vegas at the same time. So it's it's pretty convenient for that. Yeah, that was the that was the thing I tried to do here was there's a lot of companies out here from all over the world. So I tried to meet up with them, get together, at least have a coffee or have a have a drink, more a drink, have a drink, you know, and maybe then set up a coffee. But yeah, it's such a unique time because it's you get people from all over the poker industry. You have players, you have people in companies, you have people in media. And you never are gonna get to see these people all in one place except for this month and a half time period. And for me, it was sort of like, I, I wanted to try to take as much advantage of that as I could while also balancing an extremely out of line lifestyle. And I feel <laughs> like I, I fared pretty well with it, but I certainly could have done a little better because now I do regret maybe not meeting up with some people here while they're down here. And from your standpoint, do you, do you feel like there's some, there's maybe some team ups you could do with, maybe it's with companies or maybe it's with, I guess it's kind of maybe it'd probably be more with companies or with other products or potentially even with with people that are creating content. Yeah. Uh, so actually, what's what's happened recently is we just launched our affiliate program last week. Um, so what's kind of, this is kind of being the downtime for the poker schedule? It's kind of it's a great time for our business to be working on kind of you know we spend less time on the like the micro day to day level of the business and more time on sort of the macro big picture components of things. So you know, pretty much every day, you know, I woke up at, I woke up at 7 a.m. this morning to have a, you know, a meeting with like a major affiliate in Asia. Like, you know, we're just, we're just constantly, uh, we're constantly meeting with various people to sort of build this brand and get it the worldwide exposure. You know, we just, we just recently had our website translated to Spanish. We're getting a Russian translation done in the next few days and a Chinese translation done in the next week or two. Um, we're really just, uh, yeah, we're just looking to make this as global as we can. That's awesome, man. That's very cool. I love hearing things like that, especially the Spanish translation, obviously for me and for my fellow Spanish speakers out there. So affiliate programs kind of been <laughs> set up, and I guess that's going to be something where are you going to open that up to everybody out there? Because I know some people with their affiliate programs, they don't want to have just anybody promoting their product for yourself. How do you, where do you guys stand on that? Yeah, no, we think that the uh, the more affiliates you get, the more that it kind of uh, dilutes the the benefits of it. We we really want to work. You know, we're in a business where kind of one good customer is better for a bottom line than a thousand bad customers, kind of thing. So it, we're, it's probably you know there's you know with a lot of businesses you can have you know kind of like a power law component to that, but we're like we're beyond uh, we're beyond like power law. I think as far as the amount of action that people can get down. Um, so I think that we really want to focus on 
having you know a few really important, crucial, well-respected affiliates. We don't want to have people you know uh, endorsing our brand that have bad reputations. Like it's really one of those things um, that you know people have to have a lot of a lot of faith in our product uh, to to trust it. To trust that you know they're making you know, a $100 bet. And if they win, they're going to get paid their hundred thousand dollars and having, you know, having Chino Ream wearing the poker shares patch, you know, doesn't exactly uh, build that image. So yeah, we're, you know, we've, we've reached out to a few guys. We're going to reach out to a few more, uh, but we're, we're being very particular at the moment. I know you reached out to me. You're supposed to have a talk about this. So I'm sure we'll get that set up. Uh, I'm sure we'll get that set up here sometime in the future because you know, I do think uh, I do think Poker Share is a great product. I know people that, that do bet on there. I don't know if they're winning money, but I know they're having a pretty fun time on there. So I, I think uh, there might be a new bet up there recently, right? A, a new bet related to swimming, I believe. That's a, maybe a first for the Poker Shares website to to host action for a swimming prep bet. Yeah, exactly. So basically, um, so we have you know you made you made the bet against Bill on whether you could uh, on whether you'd be able to swim a mile. Uh, in after yeah so to, in, to the, in the ocean in the ocean by the this isn't like a mile in the pool I've never I've never swam before and I got to swim a mile in the Caribbean Ocean while they follow me with a boat yeah so this is I mean if the market is speaking well uh, like if the market knows what's going on you no. uh, you got it you got it in decent uh, like so basically what happened is so we you know the the way we initially made the market we priced you as maybe you got three to one odds. We priced you as maybe a two and a half to one underdog and people just keep on betting on you to succeed. So now it's at the point that you're about, the market has you as about a 1.3 to one favorite. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it's like, if, if people don't think you can do it, like, you know, a $1 bet pays out, you know, uh, $2 and 10 cents. Like, so it's, if you, if they think you can't do it. So the, the market has you as a favorite now because everyone, Everyone's got everyone's got faith in you. Oh, uh, so wait, can I? What if? How much the max bet on the site? Uh, I think it's like I think it's something like three hundred bucks or something like that. Oh, okay, all right. I was gonna like, say, put me down for ten thousand on the no, please. I'd like yeah. to I'd like to make a wager. Ten thousand on the no, yeah, no. We that 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 you wanting to bet ten thousand on the no right there is exactly why we we keep our limits fairly small for bets that are you know this exotic. Will you please put on there? Can I get bit by a shark or die? Because I'd like that to be at least on there. You do. Um, we'll consider it. We, uh, if you did get, you know, if you did get bit by a shark and died, I might feel a little guilty about that one. So I think we might have to keep that one off of poker shares. I think that you know we want to offer bets on most things, but my friend's dying. That's uh, that's a little bit cold even for me. Yeah, well, guys, if you want to follow up with that, I'll be I'll be doing videos about it. Uh, I'll be starting. I've been working out. Uh, I mean, it's day two now, so I've been been. I don't know. Well, I'll update you guys on what's gonna be happening with that. So, yeah. Uh, how, did, how did day one of swimming go? Uh, there was no day one of swimming. There was day uh -oh. one of hot Pilates. I went with my friend Pamela, and that was uh, a hard workout and so on. So I'm gonna be doing a lot of that. Be doing a lot of this hot workouts. Be doing a lot of swimming in the pool. Yeah, I'd uh, say, I'd say I would say I would say Pilates. You know, because I have, I bet 5K on you. And then also my business partner, you know, he thought you couldn't do it either. So I also bet 5K against him as well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I've got, I've got, I've got 10K on this. Um, it's pretty funny. Like we, you know, my, my business partner and I normally take the same sides and I, you know, on this one, you know, he was just like, I was like, oh, you want a piece of that? And he's like, uh, no. <laughs> and then so, you know, we talked about it back and forth and I ended up actually betting against him there. And yeah. then, you know, I, I'm, I'm basically of the belief, you know, screw the Pilates, screw this like hot yoga, screw all that stuff. Just get in this, get in the pool a couple hours a day and, <laughs> and learn to fucking swim, man. Yeah. Well, Tim Ferriss talked about this total immersion, uh, total immersion swimming where he learned how to swim in 10 days. So I think after I'm done with the podcast today, I'm going to spend some time in the pool. I'm going to be start working on that. I got some people coming by to, to give me some coaching, give me some lessons as well. And I'm planning to spend about, once I get really going, I'll be spending probably three to five hours a day in the pool. And there's no chance I'm going to fucking lose this prop bet, Mike. There's no, I'm, I might die, but I got 12 hours to finish this. I got to do it by the 27th of September. I will learn how to float in my back for seven hours straight if I have to. There is no way I lose this prop bet. I will go down in the fucking ocean before I lose this prop bed and before I get out of the water. 
That's where I stand. <laughs> Unless I get bit by like an animal. If I get bit by an animal, I hope it's live stream because that'd be pretty epic. But uh, I just hope I survive. That's that's all I got. Yeah, I think I think the most important thing, you know, more so than even get dodging animals, is just don't swallow too much water and go at a reasonable enough pace that you don't get cramps. Uh, getting getting cramps in the water is, I think, the the main way that people would lose, you know, would like withdraw from long distance swimming races or something. So that's you know, pick a good pace, don't swallow too much water, and then just fucking practice, just practice, practice, practice. Yeah, I have that, my my thinking is, if I can play six hundred thousand hands in a month, I can probably swim a mile. I I, I don't know, I just don't see how I, I I won't be able to do it. Yeah, I mean, I think. I think with this with this swimming, you're just chasing the dream, and I think you'll be uh, I think you'll be I think you'll be able to catch it. Oh man, chasing the swimming dream here. What else? So let's talk a little bit more about the the World Series Poker Main Event, a little bit about Poker Go, and uh, yeah, I'm kind of interested to get your perspective on how you thought this year went. So Poker Go stream not as many events as in years past for the for the World Series of Poker, but they did a stream the entire main event. For the mm -hmm. most part, not the entire, I guess, for the most part, though, with that ESPN, ESPN2, and then with Poker Go. So, looking back in retrospect at exactly what happened, what do you do? You feel like it was success? Do you feel like it could have been done better? Where do you kind of stand on on the turnout of things? Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I think the I think the production, the way it was done, the team of people they had, I think it was just phenomenal. Um, I think that I think this is great for poker. It really encourages engagement. Uh, yeah, I think that's awesome. I really, I mean, just the the monthly fee associated with the app, I really think scares a lot of people off. Yep. And it also also giving you the option between ten dollars a month or a hundred for the year, it just it's just so easy to just get it for the series. Like you know, a couple of days ago, I canceled my Poker Go subscription, kind of thing, where I'm just okay. yeah, I'm just gonna like you know, I'm I'm probably gonna resubscribe, you know, one or two other times during the year or whatnot, but. I would be someone who probably watches more poker on TV than a lot of people, and I still, you know, don't like. It feels just like kind of an unnecessary expense. I imagine. I think just doing, you know, a little bit more advertising or or so, finding a way of having people pay for it more indirectly rather than directly is just going to massively increase their numbers, increase ratings, and I think that I think even just making someone pay like one cent for something. You know, it takes away a lot of people. Like, I don't think, I don't think, I doubt they're making. I mean, I haven't, I haven't looked at their business model, but I, I just don't think that. Um, I just don't think this ten dollars a month is going to be that big for them long term. And I think that building, you know, size and scalability to their brand should have more value. Like, I think if you if you have someone just watching watching poker go every day, like let's say, you know, you have one person who's paying a hundred bucks a year, or you could have 10 people that are watching poker go whenever they can, you know, see the commercials that they show, you know, see the ads in the background, hear, think, hear you know, things talked about. Like I think, I think working more with, more with advertisers will lead to more profit if you can just increase your user base that much more. So that's, you know, I love, I love the content. But, and you know, the $10 isn't the end of the world, but I think for a lot of people, it is a pretty big expense and it prevents them from allowing, from spending money on poker girl related stuff down the line. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I guess I've talked with the guys a lot, so I kind of have a, you know, idea of, of where they're thinking and, and where they're trying to go with it. And I think the idea is that, you know, the 999 might not be a lot of money for one person, but if you get that up to 10,000 people now, you know, now they start making more money. And now there's more people tuned in. Now they can still sell that same advertising space as well, mm -hmm. and they can still make money from that too. But, and that, I think but now, that, but now that advertising space, the advertising space is worth a lot less if it's only right. if only ten thousand people are seeing it than a hundred thousand people are seeing it. That's that's it's I mean, like, yeah, it's like the big debate between tele. Like that's kind of what television is now, where where you know, yeah, it's for free, and then okay, we have a lot of more people watching, and then they can sell that to the advertisers. And I think we've kind of seen is that a lot of people are going away from that model, whether it's WWE, whether it's HBO, a lot of these different things are going away from that model. So maybe like, I mean, it makes some, it makes sense to me. That's kind of what I would say at first too, is why don't you just do that? It makes sense. Everyone else does, but it does seem like a lot of other companies are going away from that. And maybe the money just isn't there as we might think it is. And there's more money in this subscription based, subscription based fee. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, like it could be, yeah, it could be they're doing the right thing. I'm, you know, I'm not an expert on this or anything, but that's just, that's just my thoughts on it. Um, mm. I just, I just feel like, you know, if, if you, like you're in not too dissimilar of a spot from them, I would say you have, I'd say there's more loyalty to Joe Ingram than there is loyalty to Poker Go. If you, if you had your user base, I have no idea how many people occasionally watch Joe Ingram videos, but let's say there's, there's 200,000 people out there that occasionally watch a Joe Ingram video. I have no idea if it's more or less, but let's say the number's 200,000. If you started charging people $10 a month to be able to see your videos, how many do you think would, would be paying? <laughs> That'd be really interesting. I have no idea. I mean, I guess it's kind of like what Crush Live Poker in a way did. Bart Hansen used to have his, his podcast he did for free with the Deuce Plays and with Cash Plays, and then he turned that into a, a membership site, which does also offer other content too. So it's it's not quite the same thing. But in a lot of ways, I feel like it kind of is a model for people who who want to do something like that. You sort of you take your free product, you put out free stuff, and then you turn that into a, a, a paywall sort of thing like that. Mm -hmm. And I actually don't know many people in other genres who have done something like that. And I feel like you'd get a lot of you'd get a lot of backlash for that. Like I've thought about like could I do that? But at the same time, then it's like, well, I'm gonna have guests on. The guests know that they're doing a podcast that's behind a paywall. Yeah, but I think it gets less exposure for them. Like right. you know, if there's if I knew only like let's say your two hundred thousand people turned into two hundred paid subscribers or something like that. I don't even know if I'd want to be on this if it's only 200 guys that are that are going to end up seeing it. So I think you know, obviously, what you're doing and what they're doing are very different, but they're not. They're not. It's you're doing something closer to them than what 99% of people in the poker world are, and it seems like you just lose so much of your market by doing that. Um, I feel like it kind of goes against like it, it kind of goes against why I started doing the podcast too. I mean. I don't <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like it literally, it's literally like a contra and that's kind of why my my you know I'm gonna say I got an issue with it, but I, I get where they're coming from just because I've you know I've, I've talked with them a lot about it, but at the same time, like I do want content to be available to everybody in the entire world to see. And now the argument is is that well the content probably wouldn't be created if if they weren't if they didn't start Poker Go, there wouldn't be this new Poker After Dark show. There wouldn't be the main event stream this year. There wouldn't be a Poker Masters. There wouldn't be an Aria High Roller series. There might not be the show I'm gonna be on too coming up here without Poker Go and them deciding that, okay, this is the route we're gonna go. So mm -hmm. I definitely get that argument as well. And it's really hard for me to argue with that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, just from you know, just from my standpoint where high stakes poker, poker after dark got so many people into poker and it's just such a such epic shows that made so many people hardcore fans of the players and the game. Now those people are not going to be able to see it. Those people are not going to probably be able to find it oftentimes. Mm -hmm. And to me, that part just really sucks. Yeah, no, I'm, we're definitely in agreement on that one there. Um, we'll see. Yeah, we'll see how it all plays out. I mean, I, I'm a big, uh, I'm a big believer in anyone who's like innovating in poker and doing something new with poker. Like, you know, I've, I've spoken, you know, highly about party in the past, but also, you know, people like you and Doug Polk uh, doing, you know, putting out content that makes poker fun, that gets exposure to poker, that, you know, you know, me messes, messes with stars occasionally in, in Doug's <laughs> recent video. Like stuff like that, I think is, it's exciting and it gets, it kind of uh, refuels people's interest in the game. And I think, I think with Poker Go, they're doing something similar to that where they're, they're trying, they're trying new things. They're going back to some old things that worked in the past that were gone for a few years. Like, I think that, yeah, I just think that I think they're great. I think they're great for the game overall. I do want to tell people that the Poker After Dark lineups I'm hearing about, some, some, some legends are in these lineups and some guys we've been wondering where they may have been these past couple of years. They may be playing in these games too. I, this is just what I'm hearing through the grapevine. So I'm pretty excited to see what they got in store for for Poker After Dark and for the lineups they're going to put together. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be. I think it's going to be pretty exciting. Like Poker After Dark was one of my favorite shows, like even beyond poker shows, probably one of my favorite shows ever. Like watching, you know, watching that when I was like 18 and stuff. Those like those episodes are sweet. The content was sweet. The games are sweet. They're high. They're high stakes with crazy lineups. It's uh, okay. well, it's going to be exciting. What's it about that makes it sweet? Because is it 
the players that you know the players? Is it the the players being just world debatably world class, and then the, the action that goes along with it? Maybe it being a six handed format as well too. What aspect of it makes it great for you? I th I think the mixture of world class players with less than world class players playing for very high stakes is uh, is what makes it quite exciting. Mm -hmm. uh, that that's what I and then yeah so I mean these days it would be probably mostly people I know but when I was watching this you know I when I was when I was 18 the only guys I knew were like the 18 year old poker players and you know they weren't they weren't old enough to play poker after dark like I think you needed to be 21 to play that show um, so it was just yeah it was just sort of you know I remember I remember when when Tom turned 21 and then all of a sudden you have like an online kid you know, playing in po on high stakes poker. It was pretty cool to see that when before that, you know, there just weren't, it was all guys from like the pre poker boom era and kind of seeing the, you know, the younger online generation work their way into high stakes games like 10 years ago, 11 years ago now was pretty exciting. You remember how cool it was when Brian Townsend first played on high stakes poker? We used to see exactly. this dude. Absolutely. Like he, he was crushing online, then all of a sudden he just shows up in high stakes poker that one season. It was just like that was super. Like I loved times like that. I loved moments like that. You mentioned Durr, obviously Durr, this phenom online started playing live and just it was a goddamn maniac, man. I don't know. It was just it, it was it was amazing to watch. And I think that 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 you know kind of going from that online and then seeing can some of these guys prove it in that live arena. I think that was a, a big appeal for for many people too. Yeah, and it's like you felt so sort of proud for them. Like when I see someone who has a two plus two account wins a tournament these days, I just could care less whether they have a two plus two account or not. But back in the day, it really felt like a community where it's like I'm a two plus twoer. You know, Tom Dwan's a two plus twoer. You know, Brian Townsend is a two plus twoer. Like, look, we're on high stakes poker. Like, you know, it felt it felt like you know the whole community was behind those guys. And it was, it was like, you know, it felt like it was us against them, like the young nerdy kids against like the old guard who's been playing in, you know, in casinos for decades and stuff. And it was a really, I just thought it was a really uh, just exciting transition when, when the online community started playing high stakes live poker. So I was thinking about this today and these past couple days, I've been thinking about the podcast and podcast guests. When I started doing the podcast, mainly all the guests I knew from the online world. When I think about the, what the online world is right now, and it's not only completely segregated in many ways because you have so many different little sites that no one even knows about that people play on, and it just doesn't seem like, like the high stakes games, the people that are still playing high stakes on Poker Stars at Nolan and Hold'em and, and Popman Omaha, the great game, and the mixed games, for the most part, still those same players that have been playing now for years. And a lot of guys that maybe wanted to come out and get some exposure, I feel like they've come out and got some exposure. Other guys have stayed sort of quiet and seem like they intend to want to stay quiet for the foreseeable future. So I find it like, when I think about what the online poker world is now, it's just so much different to me than it was three years ago, obviously completely different than it was seven plus years ago. Mm -hmm. So where do you sort of see that online cash game ecosystem going here over these next couple of years? Um, I mean, I hope it, I hope it kind of, uh, I hope it stays lucrative enough that people are still making a living. Like I, I really, I mean, the, t the technologies out there that allow, you know, computers to play poker are getting so much better. So I really, you know, I hope that they manage to do a good job of policing that so that, you know, online cash games can still exist. If not, I think a lot of the, you know, online cash game players, you know, we've seen this already, but more will start playing tournaments, more will move to playing live games, you know, various, uh, various things like that. I think we'll, you know, whether it's, yeah. Online or live tournaments or live cash games, I think will have longer, uh, long, longer lifespans. Where do you where do you stand right now on uh, on what's happening with the poker sites, man? Party Poker put out this new tournament schedule. They got a twenty five thousand dollar buy in event listed on there. Obviously, okay. they've got a lot of new ambassadors. They've got some younger ambassadors like a Kristen Bicknell, Chrissy B. They've got the old school guy Marcel Luce. They got Jan Peter Yachman for Germany. It seems like they're doing a lot of cool things. 8 8 Poker obviously was a big part of the World Series of Poker this year. They were all over the advertising and the banners. They had a bunch of cool things, little like get-togethers, gatherings that went down out there as well too. It seems like they're very – it seems like they're investing more into poker as well. Mm -hmm. where, do you, where do you see this going with these three sites now? You know, kind of maybe maybe doing some competition. Then we got Run at Once Poker lurking in the background. We got Phil Galfine in the lab. 
doing something who you and you know what Phil's working on something it's gonna be good yeah I mean so so the one thing I'll say is I can def I mean I haven't talked to Phil in a while but just guessing at things I can definitely empathize with with his situation like with with this business I thought you know the amount of time from when we first started brain brainstorming for the idea to going live we thought it would be four months um, and it ended up being 20 months so you know I can and I think I think a poker site requires a lot more software than uh, you know than a gambling than like a sports betting site effectively. So I can I can understand that you know Phil is probably having to do a lot more uh, you know a lot more paperwork, a lot more dealing with regulators, a lot more just hoops that you're not used to jumping through as a poker player that you have to. Uh, as an operator, um, so I can, you know, I can tell you that that process it, it can be fairly tedious. You know, you have to do it well, and I think, you know, yeah, I think a lot of people, you know, they say, oh, why, you know, why isn't Run at Once Poker live yet? I mean, this shit takes time, and all this stuff that feels like it should be take, you know, thirty minutes takes three months. So like, there's there's so many there's so many things outside of your control that go ridiculously slowly. Uh, it can be pretty frustrating at times. Um, I, you know, I, I would, I'd be excited to see what they're, uh, what they end up doing back to your original point about the three big companies. Yeah. It's, it's just exciting to see competition. Like, I think that, you know, I think that, um, you know, pe people kind of hate on stars and stuff like that, but I would guess that, you know, if they're just acting in what's the best interest for their business, the best interest is when you've got a monopoly to kind of beat the people down. And then when you have competition to start innovating yourself and investing in poker more. So it's as, as party and 888 start, uh, start doing more good things for poker. I would assume part stars will as well, uh, because yeah. they'll kind of have to. So it's, it's a weird thing where, you know, it's kind of, you know, you can, uh, yeah, they're, they can just sort of emulate the strategies of what their competitors are doing. And, you know, there'll be some people that they've lost as customers for life. But a lot of people that will just be like, okay, you know, if they come back out with a good rate back program, people may come back or, you know, whatever it happens to be. I imagine, I just think competition will drive innovation. Yeah, I was thinking that. I've been telling some people that too. I feel like as Party and 88 start doing more, more things, more innovative things, trying to get more people. And I, 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 you know, I don't know if innovative is the right word with some of the things that Party and 88 are doing. I feel like they're maybe catching up to what's already been going on for years. And that's always been my biggest complaint is what the fuck are they doing and what like why I, and you know from talking more I got I, and I understand you know why they maybe were in the position that they were in and why they chose that route but I, I do think that as these sites start making more progress all of a sudden poker stars turns out they're maybe for the regulars again they're for the players again they're not just trying to take every dollar out of you as they, quick as they possibly can with the chest and the fucking jackpots and the spins and all this kind of stuff I feel like there's gonna be some ideas that do come out that are gonna people are gonna say yeah I do like that and basically it took 8 at 8 party it took these sites finally decided to do something so I, I'm pretty happy from the standpoint I'm seeing at I but you mentioned the technology so from the cash game side of things I don't know man it just seems like it's a crazy world out there Michael it seems like there may be some things out there that are not are, are not in line with uh, with with future future thriving cash game world online. So it, it's kind of scary from that standpoint. But tournament poker is yeah. doing looks like it's going to be doing well. So yeah, exactly. The, uh, there don't seem to be any uh, out of line technologies for tournaments the way that there are for cash games. And then if they are there, the maximum stakes they can exist at are much lower. The player pools are much bigger. You know, it's less uh, it's less scary. Yeah. Uh, Anthony Lukovic says, stop doing coke. Listen, guys, I got to address this, okay? If people are going to say I do cocaine, at least let me do the – I got no problem admitting if I'm breaking if I'm breaking some potential terms of service here in Las Vegas like that. If I was doing it, I'd be happy to tell you. But I'm just pumped up by life, man. I'm back doing the podcast grind. I got a crazy prop bet booked here. I'm talking with my buddy Mike McDonald, who is who is changing the, the poker shares gambling world of things. I got people in the chat right now. It's a beautiful day outside. I mean, life is good, guys. What can I say, man? I'm, I'm a little bit excited to uh, just be doing things right now. So, what's thing about that, Mike? Do people ever accuse you of maybe uh, breaking terms of service with, uh, with substances? Yeah, I mean, the the one that I get a lot is 
people, th people th uh, when I was doing more streaming, people always thought I was smoking pot. Like it would be, it'd probably be like the most common question I got is like, oh, are you high Mike? Do you smoke a lot of pot? You know, I'm, I'll smoke pot maybe, you know, a couple times a year. I don't even really like it that much. <laughs> so it's a weird, I'm completely for it. You know, a lot of my friends are really into it, but it just, it, the question keeps on coming up kind of thing. So you, you get, you get some recurring, you get some recurring questions. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's, you know, some people think that some people, just, some people think just cause we're kind of in the public eye, we get out of line even more than we actually do. Yeah. Well, you, what, what's up with you and Fedor recently, man? I saw this photo, you and Fedor were in some mountain town. From what I knew, Fedor wasn't planning to be in a mountain. Well, how did this happen? What was what, coming to be? Yeah, this is, this, uh, so this is like, okay, this is actually pretty crazy. I'm going to give, I've been, I've just been having the most small world moments of all time. So basically within a one week stretch, first of all, we, we, uh, we did this hike up a mountain and partway up the mountain, we met these two people that were like childhood friends of A.E. Jones. And they're, and he's from, he's from uh, like Hammond, Indiana. Yeah, Hammond, yeah. Indiana, up in, up in Alberta. So that was crazy. Then basically, then I'm walking down the street at literally the next day. And then I just walk by some guy and I'm like, Mike? Like Mike Kelly? And then uh, it, was a, it was a guy that I, I knew from growing up. I haven't seen him in like five, six years, but he was like, he was like my best friend's younger brother. Uh, you know, and he was, he was just out in Canmore for a vacation. And on top of that, you know, talk to him for a little bit, you know, just catch up. And then I'm just like, oh, like you, uh, you and your girlfriend, like want to grab a beer later. And he's like, oh, like literally any other night I would. And then shows me his girlfriend's hand. And then he had just proposed to her like an hour earlier. And he's like, uh, you know, we've, we've got to get back to the hotel room. So then, that was the next coincidence. And then the biggest of all is maybe four days later, I'm walking down the street and I hear somebody like Mike, Mike McDonald, and you know, I, I go and get my autograph book ready, ready to ready you to go like sign sign an autograph or something. And then I look over and it's Fedor, and I'm like, what the fuck? Like, it was it was such a surreal moment because like I would not have expected him to be in Canada, let alone Canmore, um, a town of twelve thousand people. Uh, so I was just like, oh, what are you doing out here? And you know, he mentioned some guys that he had done like an internship with. Uh, they they just planned like a hiking trip out in the Canadian Rockies. He's like, what are you doing out here? Like I assumed. I assumed he knew that I live there. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, I lived out here. I moved here like two months ago. So yeah, people saw pictures of us and assumed it was, we had planned a trip together, but just pure coincidence. It was, it was super, it was super weird. That is, that is very random. I mean, very a random. random yeah. like a, a Canadian, a Canadian small town with a mountain town fader just goes up there. It was during like June too. It was during the World Series of Poker. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, I was, I was, exp I was explaining to a buddy. So I was walking with a buddy of mine, one of my good friends in high school. I haven't seen that much in the last 10 years or so. And uh, I was basically saying like, you know, on the poker rankings list, I'm probably like 20th all time. And of the 19 people ahead of me, literally probably 18 of them are in Vegas right now. And that would be like the, that would probably be the only like, you know, more successful live player than me in the whole world who's not in Vegas, let alone in fucking small town, small town Canmore. It was, yes, yeah, so then we ended up hanging out, like just had like dinner, uh, hung out back at my place, you know, talked some business. Like it's, it's kind of funny how both of us, you know, him much so much more so than me, were kind of like, you know, the wonder kid in poker for a little while. And now we're sort of like the, you know, the recreational entrepreneurial kind of guys. So we had, uh, we talked some business, hung out with some of his friends with some of my friends, uh, tried to go out drinking. Uh, Fedor didn't bring his ID and then wasn't allowed in. <laughs> it's, and the drinking age is 18 out here, and they wouldn't let Fedor into they wouldn't let Fedor into the bar. Uh, but it was yeah, it was it was good to catch up with him. It was a uh, massive coincidence, but yeah. So there was you know if he brought his ID, maybe we could have gotten out of line, but I'd stay in line. What what are you thinking about the Prime Mind? You've been priming your mind. You've been what do you what do you, what do you stand on the Prime Mind application right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, I, I think it's a cool concept. I think that it's, it's not something, you know, a lot of people are massive believers in this. I am, you know, I am less so than a lot of people, but I've still, you know, I've still been using the app. I've listened to a handful of them. Uh, you know, Elliot's a very good speaker and I think it's a cool concept. The app looks really clean. Uh, yeah, I just think it's, 
I think it's I think it's cool to to see the exposure it's been getting as well. Like when Fedor's name is tied to it, um, and it seems like he's really passionate about what he's doing, which I think is which I think is one of the most important things. I think I think with a lot of people in poker, um, after an, after a certain amount of time, they lose some of the love for the game or the passion that they originally had, and getting to see you know getting to see that sort of reigniting in people uh you know say so like someone like you with like with the podcast and uh you know with youtube and stuff like that it's it's exciting to see what people do after poker that kind of you know brings sort of the same fire out of them that they originally had for the game uh so it's, it was exciting to see you know how much he really loves the project he's pursuing yeah i think like you know when you when i mentioned i think about myself in poker and patmanamaha I feel like, you know, I was questioning, is, is, the, is the passion maybe not the same as it once was, or is it more passion for maybe doing other things? And I think the biggest thing for me is that it's just not as easy to really play PLO online anymore as it used to be. You know, online, you, you just you load up and play. you got a, a number of different sites to choose from. Now it's, you know, I'm here. I, I've been playing a lot lately, going ACR, and there's probably like five fucking bots on the site that are playing all the tables. So yeah. you know, you're playing from these opponents in Russia, Belarus, and, and Ukraine, and, like, there are four guys on the table, and then there's, like, another guy. I'm like, what the – you know, it's just – it's hard to – I still love playing the game, but it's hard to be, get that excitement going when, you know, you're just like, what, what, what the fuck's really happening here? So – and I think it is pretty cool that – we do see some guys out there because it's hard to really, it's hard to find something else, man. It's hard to find something else that one, you may be not only good at two, you can make some sort of living from and three, you then have the passion to keep getting better and better at mm -hmm. as we're coming for poker players. So I think that as more people do find that, then I feel like that also inspires other people to be like, you know what? I did learn a lot from, from my time in poker. I, I got a lot of, you know, I got a lot of skill and different abilities that maybe I didn't think about. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to go pursue something that I can use those skills and abilities in. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, man, I, I, it's, it's going to be interesting to see where more guys go in the near future. And it does seem like a lot of guys I know from the high stakes guys are getting more into entrepreneurship, which just makes sense. You're your boss in that situation. There's an opportunity to make a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So it'll be, it'll be fun to follow along with people as these next five, 10 years take place. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I think a lot of, a lot of the things that, poker players will pursue, I think won't be intuitive to them and won't necessarily come naturally. But I think that the the sort of mentality and thought process that goes into being like a top poker player, I think can be translated to a lot of other things. So I don't think, you know, I think a, a lot of people I think are good, who are really good at poker, picked it up fairly quickly and were somewhat of a natural and it kind of ramped up aggressively. I think with a lot of the things they pursue after the fact, they'll have to deal with sort of the, the difficulty of it not coming as naturally as poker did and there being uh, you know, a longer learning curve. But I think that that will be, I think that in the end, if people are able to commit themselves to it, a lot of poker players will be accomplishing some pretty big things outside of the field. That's a good point about, you know, kind of back in the day, I think we saw that with some people that they sort of picked up poker fast, they moved up fast, they didn't necessarily maybe put in a lot of work. So if you talk with them, they never say, you know, I, I worked really hard on my game to get to this point. And you're like, well, you know, I, I'm good at poker. I, I ran good. I moved up fast. I got lucky in some spots, and and now I'm one of the best players. Yeah. But I think to make it poker now in a lot of ways, especially online, and if you made it for many years, you had to put in that consistent work over periods of time. So now you sort of learn how to go overcome adversity in some spots. You learn how to keep being consistent and consistent and consistent with working on your game for years, periods of time. So now when you go into these other fields, you're gonna you're gonna encounter these same challenges. So it's maybe going to be easier for you to understand how to approach that. Whereas maybe some of the guys back in the day who've talked about struggling to find out what to get into never didn't have that same experience with learning poker and getting really good at poker. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's very, it is very true that games were so good back in the day that it, it led to some pretty aggressive, um, uh, rise ups in poker. Like I recently went sort of down the rabbit hole of old two plus two posts um and and read through some of my posts from like you know, you know from like a while back and was just sort of realizing what i played and it's when it's happening to you you don't really realize how how quick things are sort of flying but i i basically i, I had an 18 month stretch where i went from basically being a two four limit hold'em player who had never played never played no limit had never played 
you know, higher than two four in a limit to being pro like within 18 months, I was uh, playing, playing high stakes heads up and high stakes six max and short stacking nose, nosebleed six max, sometimes mm -hmm. short stacking nosebleed uh, heads up, like playing up to 500, a thousand cap, uh, running a big staking operation and being probably one of the best online tournament players in the world. And the, the, the staking operation included backing people for live 10 Ks and stuff like that. So it was, were you like it's, 13, dude? Wait, wait, you were, how, were you were pretty young. Wait, eight, yeah. you were 18 years old. Never mind. You were 18. Yeah. Eight, 18th birthday. But it was, it was, it was literally 18. Like if I wanted, if you told me now, okay, Mike, you have 18 months to, I don't know, learn how to play just heads up, no limit at mid stakes. I don't know if I would succeed at it. Like, you know, give me 18 months. I might not be beating, you know, three, six heads up these days. And then back then it was just sort of, you know, the games were so good that if you were really willing to put in the time, you had, you know, smart friends to learn from, you were, you know, obsessive about your study, you, you could really move way faster. And there's, there's not many other industries in the world that would be as soft as poker was a decade ago to where, yeah, like I, I sucked, like I really sucked, but most people were a little bit worse kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, uh, I don't know, man, it's never, probably is never going to quite, it's definitely never going to look the same things in terms of just the technology now and the advancements made in poker strategy and poker ability, obviously the bot situation too, the, the players. But I do think, I've noticed this when I've been playing with American players is that if, you know, obviously we talk about this for years now, if any sort of American mass legislation does come back into place and it's only Americans that can then play on these sites, I feel like that will be something for a period of time. I don't know how long that period of time is going to last, but I do feel like that's going to be something just because the skill level of American players has just you know, dropped down, I feel like, so much compared to the rest of the world players simply because they don't have that online to play every day. They've been playing live. They play with these home games with fun players where you never have to learn certain qualities and eventually over a couple of years, you, you maybe forget about those qualities that exist at all. And then to be able to have to pick those back up again to compete against good players, that's going to be very challenging. So if it ever happens in 2020 or whatever, and maybe bots will be powerful and American the bots will be undetectable at that point in time, who knows, but, but it could be interesting, man. I'm still holding out hope, Mike. I got, I got some hope. I, I'm, I'm invested in poker shares that that'll happen by 2020 right now. So I don't know. We'll that'd, be, that'd, be, that'd be pretty nice. And I mean, we'll, we'll need to see how U S poker develops, but I'm very much in agreement that games would be games would be a little, uh, a little bit better, uh, if yeah. they were to have American only player pools. Bruno Mavazali, my buddy and Bruno in the chat says, please ask Mike if he needs poker shares to be translated to Portuguese. I'm down to help with that. Thank you very much. Uh, so Portuguese was the second language we have on the site. We've had, we've had our site available in Portuguese for several months now. Uh, we have a huge Brazilian user base and we have pretty much from day one. Um, and you know, my business partner, he's, uh, he's multilingual. He, uh, he's on the B on the BGG, uh, got a, got a Brazilian, got a Brazilian wife. And, uh, we, we had it, um, you know, translated to Portuguese months ago. So we're, uh, we're, we're one step ahead of you, Bruno. Mike, you think, do you think Brazilians are, are overall fun poker players? Because I saw something the other day. <coughs> I have some oatmeal stuff in my throat here as I get laying. There was a, a back and forth between Patrick Leonard and Faraz Jaka on Twitter. I think maybe Patrick made a joke about the Brazilian triple where, I don't know, they shove all in from the butt in the small blind, big blind, you know, shout to Brazil. And yeah. then Faraz got a little offended, say, you know, I don't know why you're putting down Brazilians like that, why you're berating Brazilians. You know, people say this about Brazilian people that they're not good at poker or whatever, something like that. It felt like, do you think that Brazilians overall, would you say that they're kind of uh, a little bit more on the fun side? Uh, yeah, I mean, I would say there's, a, I mean, there's certain communities where the, the whole community is professional players, some where it's all recreational players. It seems like for the larger markets that are fairly developed that have been around poker for a while, I'd say there's more recreational Brazilian players than a lot of other uh, communities. Yeah, I think so too, man. I know a couple guys, shout out to my boy Gabriel Goffey, Verbal Oasis, you know, one of the, one of the, the legends of high stakes PLO too. But overall, man, I don't know. It seems like the the conditions down in Brazil in terms of to play live poker. I mean, I've heard about what live poker is like down there. It's not conducive for grinding up a role and and really getting good at the game. It's conducive to getting your fucking money and not paying too much rake and like yeah. not 
not getting yes. robbed. So it's like it, it's it seems like such different conditions to actually try to get better at poker in that you know it starts to make maybe more sense why you maybe see some plays and the overall kind of the overall I guess skill level in some areas is is what it is. But at the same time, I do think there are some really good Brazilian poker players too. But I just find the interesting how like you know Faraz kind of uh, seemed like he was pretty offended by that comment. But it I, I could understand where. Patrick was coming from with it when he when he says that and you know whether he's saying like I hate all Brazilians they're all fish I don't think that's what he's saying but that was kind of an interesting topic because it's something I think about a lot is these countries and is it a bad thing to just stereotype people from one country as as bad or is it could that be a, a detriment and for growing the game there and I'm just not really sure yeah I mean these these things are it's tough to tell like I would need to see context to see you know, if I, uh, if I think Patrick is out of line or whatnot. So I don't, I don't really know. I think that, you know, with poker in general, it's good not to tap the glass, I think. Um, but I can't, yeah, I can't really comment on this specifically. Yeah, shout out to my girl, Vivi Saliba, one of my favorite Brazilian pop limit Omaha players in the entire world. Shout out to her. She was the only woman under 26 years old to play the World Series Poker Man event this year, Mike. I found this stat shocking. It seemed like to me there'd be like, First of all, yeah. it's easy to sell action to the main event as anyone, yeah. as a person. People, people buy a blind man for the main event. Mike, Mike might have had action in people for the main event this year that he, he might not have had hands. You know what I mean? And, and I think I saw a couple guys playing that actually have hands in the World Series this year. But it's easy to sell action for the main event one. It's easy to sell action for poker tournaments. From my experience, what I've seen with a lot of the women I know that play poker tournaments. So I just find it really surprising that we didn't see more younger women playing the main event this year. Yeah, I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think it's basically, there's, there just aren't, well, first of all, there aren't that many girls in poker. And then yeah. second of all, it's just not really a hobby that, you know, I don't think it used to be every 18 year old in first year of college plays like a poker home game with their buddies. And now I think that's just a smaller part of the culture, like beyond, beyond just there only being one girl, uh, there weren't that many guys. And most of the guys are in Europe. Like I'd be interested in seeing how many American 21 to 25 year old uh, guys play. Like, I guess it's probably just a few dozen or something. Um, I, don't, I don't know the numbers, but I would guess it's a pretty small amount. Uh, so I think that, yeah, I think, I think it's just, it's the, we, I, think, I think stuff like Twitch is good for engaging more of the younger crowd. But I think that, I think as we were saying earlier, it's tougher to grind up a role. Like, you know, it's, even if you can sell off action, it doesn't, you know, if you've got a, you know, 30K bankroll, you don't necessarily want to put, you know, 3K of your money into one tournament or something like that. I think that, uh, you know, I think that there's, and, and even and the main event, it's not as, I, I was having this chat with Brian Rast recently. Um, basically, the main event used to be soft enough that it was, you know, if you just know a guy who, play some poker, you know, can hand read a little bit, like he's going to be crushing. Like that was kind of our mentality, you know, back a lot of your friends who are, you know, if you beat 50 cent a dollar online, you're winning 200% of the main or whatever it is. But we were kind of saying this year that the, the good players have gotten so good uh, and the structure is so good that, you know, to be winning in this tournament, you kind of need to think, okay, what types of tables is this guy winning chips versus losing chips? And you sort of get down to, you get down to the final hundred of this tournament, and it's it's a lot of guys you recognize. It's a lot of known players. You know, people, you know, good players probably make it that far five times their share or more. And it's really, you know, it really gets to be fairly competitive later on. Uh, and I think that, you know, if you're, you know, sure you might be winning huge at your starting table, but if once the stakes get high, you're slowly dwindling, you can't really be winning in there. So I think that. You know, if you're just if you're hopping in the main event as the twenty fifth hundred twenty five hundredth best player out of seven thousand, you're probably losing, kind of thing. Like I think so much of the profit gets eaten up by the top thousand players. Yeah, it's something I've been talking about with some people out here. I always talk about how so super soft the main event is, and, and that was sort of my thing. I'm I'm trying to say is that a lot of when we go deep in these tournaments. I mean, we know a lot of these guys. We know they they've got poker backgrounds. They they've got a lot of experience. And it's very rare we see even like a guy like Hess break through. Like his first, this is like his biggest cash, his old biggest cash was, I think Terrence Chan told me on the podcast the other day, it was like 700 bucks or something like that at a at a $10 rebuy tournament in England. And now he's playing at the main event, takes home what, 
1.5 million, 2.5 million, something like that. It's very rare we see a guy like John Hess break through that break through there. And I feel like that's sort of what you find, you know, maybe not to that same level with some of these other guys who talk about playing the main event, how it's so soft, but you know, yeah, it, it, I, I feel like it is tougher and I don't know if people are going to agree with that or not because people never, they, then I say that they laugh at me and especially people on Twitter this year when they saw the main event final table, it seemed like they thought the overall play level there was very, very weak. And they're more excited for the future of the main event than ever before. So I don't know what you think about the play at the, at the final table here. Um, so I think that a lot of people underestimate what it's like to have your to play the highest stakes poker game you've ever played in by a lot, and have every hand you play under such scrutiny. Um, you know, I think the I think the level of play at the final table was quite low, but I think the level of play at any high stakes poker table is going to be pretty low kind of thing. Like I remember, um, which there was one, there was one year the main event had what I thought was a pretty tough final table. And then watching it, I think everyone just played super shitty. Uh, let me figure out what year this was. Mark, Martin Jakobsen year when he won, the cleaner was there. Uh, kind of I don't, no, it wasn't, it, it wasn't that year. Let me figure, let me figure out which year it was. Um, it was, uh, it was the Ryan Reese year. Uh, I think if you look through the names of that final table, it's a it's a bunch of uh, just good players, almost all professionals. And I think almost I think when watching it that year, I felt like almost everyone was just playing really bad throughout. And I think it's just you know I, I'm not trying to like you know fire shots or anything. I'm just saying that you know when 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 I play uh, stakes that are uncomfortably high for me, I think I'm unlikely to play my A game. And for almost everyone who makes the main event final table, the stakes are going to be uncomfortably high for them. Uh, so I think it's kind of, you know, it's, it's, it's easy for people to sort of sit on the sideline and say that, oh, they think, you know, you could, they think these guys could be making better plays, but you know, when they get, when they get final three tables of a WPT that's 400 K to the winner, if every hand was under such scrutiny, they'd probably be playing like shit too. And then if you multiply those stakes by 20 and multiply the exposure by a thousand, they're going to play even shittier. <laughs> so, so basically, basically my point is that it's, it's tough to perform under pressure, especially when you've got, you know, thousands of just like, you know, armchair quarterbacks ready to, uh, ready to like call you out on it. So basically I, I think the level of play was low, but I think it should be kind of be expected for the level of play to be low. Hmm. I think I had a question on two plus two, and the question had to do with where do you see yourself in five years? So obviously now you've been you've been doing poker shares now for a little bit of time. You've been seeing the challenge with that, maybe how successful it potentially can be. Five years from now, what do you see yourself doing? Um, that's a good question. Uh, I've I've never really been one for uh for looking that far ahead, I suppose. Um, like, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of one of those things where, <laughs> I mean, this sounds stupid, but when I was giving that example of, you know, playing high, playing high stakes cash online, you know, running a big stable, even then I never really saw myself as a pro poker player. Like I know, like not, I didn't see myself in the presence. I didn't even see myself in the future of like, oh, one day I'm going to be a professional poker player, right? I like travel around the world. Like I didn't, I, I just didn't, maybe I just don't, don't, I, maybe I just set smaller goals rather than bigger goals or I don't, I think sort of about the step that's next right in front of me rather than thinking about, you know, how to get to like a big destination far from now. I don't really know, but I just don't, I just don't tend to put myself in, in those shoes as much as a lot of people, you know, hopefully I'm happy in five years, but that's, uh, that's about all I really, you know, all I really want. And, you know, if I'm, if I'm playing poker, I'm playing poker. If I'm running poker shares, running poker shares. If, if poker if poker shares gets massive and five years from now we've like taken over Amaya and we're running we're running poker stars, like you know that's an option as well. Like I'm I'm pretty uh, I'm pretty open minded to the things I can do with my life, and I'm not I'm not really going to uh, you know kind of put myself in a box and say this is what I'm going to be doing. I think Amaya is the stars group now. I don't actually think it's Amaya anymore. Oh right, you're. I was. You you you're definitely right about that. I was gonna say Stars Group, but since that only got announced like a day or two ago, I figured uh, no one would know what the Stars Group is. So, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah I think Amaya, Amaya decided that they're gonna change the name to the Stars Group, which I'm sure they did it for a number of different reasons. I think that probably have some sort of 
stars line coming out with draft stars, maybe casino stars. And I feel like that's the route they're, they're thinking about going down and maybe it moves away from poker stars. It just becomes stars as the overall brand there. So fucking poker stars, man. Uh, Mark B says, would Mike take a five mile swim prop bet at the stream boat? Uh, I don't know if I'd take a five meter swim prop bet at the stream boat. I haven't, I haven't swam since I was probably about eight years old. Um, I was like, I was an okay swimmer as a kid. Like I, I did competitive swimming for a couple of years. Uh, but the reason I did competitive swimming was, uh, it was pretty like, I'm probably the worst adult swimmer of someone who swam competitively. Basically I'm just a little bit denser than most people. Uh, not just mentally, also physically, uh, we're, <laughs> we're basically, we're basically, I just don't float very well. So what happened is when you're a kid and you're going through swimming lessons, one of the things you need to do to pass is float on your back for 15 seconds. So it's like I was in a group and I was maybe, you know, the best or second best swimmer and then uh, had to float on my back, couldn't do it. So I failed. And then I had to go through and do the same level again. And then I was obviously like now much better than the, you know, the kids that like after having repeated this level and my parents, they told me like, oh, you've got to focus extra hard, do everything as well as you can. And like kind of, you know, worked at that, but still couldn't float on my back and then failed that again. And then basically my parents talked to the instructor who's, you know, probably just some like 14 year old kid or whatever. And they're, and they're just like, oh, you know, our, you know, we want our son to be a competent swimmer. You know, what do we do? And they're like, well, if he, if you, if I were to pass him through this level, the next level he's going to need to float on his back for 30 seconds or something like there's, there's no real option. They said the only other option is just put him in competitive swimming. Uh, so my parents put me in competitive swimming for a couple of years. Uh, I didn't like it. And I think it kind of, you know, kind of took away my like love for water, I suppose, where I just remember being forced to go to these like hardcore swimming lessons with these kids who like swimming was their passion, you know, used to like swim in meets and stuff like that. And I just didn't, I just didn't really like it. Uh, most sports I played growing up, I enjoyed a fair bit, but I didn't like competitive swimming. And so 20 years later, the amount of times I've swam for leisure in the last 20 years is probably like five times or something. So I, uh, I do not want to, I do not want to swim five miles. Hmm. Wish my parents would have put me put me through some swimming competitive swimming lessons back in the day, but uh, oh yeah, I, got, you I wasn't swimming. There was not many swimming pool. I feel like where, where I grew up, it was more basketball, baseball, football. So, so I never got in the pool, but I, I'm ready to get in the pool, Michael. I'm ready for yeah. this challenge. But Mike, yeah. if you want to swim yeah. that mile with me? You're more than welcome to swim that mile with me, man. I, I'd be I'd be more than happy to have you there for, with me. I don't even know if I mean I don't even know if my uh, town has a pool in it or something. If my if my town has a pool, maybe I could do some training. I wouldn't mind. Uh, I got I had shoulder surgery done a couple of years ago, and I'm kind of curious if swimming would be good for my shoulder or if I have limited enough mobility. It might be good. It might be a good idea for me to go actually try some swimming, see if I remember how to do it because uh, it's been a long time. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I it seems like they recommend pool for physical therapy stuff and for. They say it's a lot easier on your joints. I know a lot of people do it to lose weight as well. How it would be for a shoulder, sur a shoulder surgery. I hope it's good to that because I, you know, I'm getting old now. I got some body pains and sore and stuff like that. So hopefully swimming in the water is something that helps that rather than starts to aggravate those things because then it's going to make it much tougher to do. Exactly. But, uh, but yeah, we'll kind of see what happens here. Guys in the chat, man, let me get a couple more questions from Mike, man. Let me see what you guys got for him. What do you uh, what, what do you kind of have planned for the rest of this year coming up? So the stream boat, I, you, I think Bill said you talked about you're going to go down there for a bit. So yeah. what, what's kind of this next uh, five months looking like for you? Um, so I'm going, to, uh, going on the stream boat. Um, the other thing I'm doing is, so my mom, she's like a, like a diehard uh, Patriots fan. And she, she's, never, she's never been to an NFL game before. And uh, with DraftKings, they're basically having this sort of like high roller or super high roller or whatever you want to call it, where basically it's like uh, it's a 21K buy-in uh, tournament where if you if you register for the tournament, they're going to give you like a private box at the uh, at the season opener game and they'll give you like money towards airfare and hotel and all this stuff. So I just I signed up for that. My mom and I are going down to uh, to Boston to to watch the uh, the Patriots home opener. And I'll probably go right to the stream boat from there. It's a couple days before our birthday, so it's kind of like an early birthday present. So as far as as far as the next month, those are sort of that and stream boat are kind of what I have going on. Um, maybe some chance I end up going to Sochi. Uh, 
a lot of what I'm doing, I mean, the thing I'm noticing about being in the business world more is that people love face-to-face meetings. I don't know if it's the, if it's the older generation or what it is, but there's there's a lot of people who really, you know, they don't want a Skype call. They want to meet you face-to-face. I would guess a lot of my travel will be more related to, you know, building stronger relationships for when there's uh, positive partnerships for our business more so than actually trying to hop in the next high roller that's going on. So if I, if I'm doing travel related to poker, it's probably more, uh, more about poker shares than it is about, uh, poker tournaments. So a nice casual $21,000 DraftKings high roller, taking your mom down to, down to new, down to Boston, Boston for the New England Patriots home opener stream boat, maybe Sochi. I think I might be going to Sochi too. Nice. I don't know. I might be I might be dying if I go to Sochi in September, man. I, I put me in Russia. I might, <laughs> might never. Might 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 get a little out of line over there. Jesus, dude, I cannot imagine myself in Russia on the on the on the R U G G, man. I just I don't know. R U G G, yeah, could be tough. <sighs> Fucking Anatoly over there, I, I doing being a bad influence. I don't know those Russian guys. They seem they they seem they seem they don't even seem harmless they just seem like terrible influences mike um <laughs> my heart's beating fast right now thinking about being in russia for more than a couple weeks so and uh but yeah you mentioned about the the face to face meeting things that's, that's i guess that's uh maybe just older guard maybe that's where maybe that's how a lot of these guys got their got started with business so they're so used to college they're so used to all that like i guess maybe not college they're so used to just being in that office space and and meeting with so many people and traveling so much more Whereas a lot of our stuff has always been done online. We're used to Skype. We're used to FaceTime. We're used to just like this sort of interaction. Mm-hmm. So I don't know. I guess do you, do you feel like that the the one on one time you spend, if it's like in a meeting, in a meeting format or in a meeting sense, is better than like a one on one sort of with this, whether it's some FaceTime and also some Skype texting. I personally find it much more GTO, but. I don't know, maybe, maybe, I don't know, what do you think? I mean, it's, it, it's, oh, it's, it's absolutely better. It's more productive. You get a better feel for the person. But when you have to couple it, you know, with a flight to Sochi or a flight to Sao Paulo or whatever yeah. it happens to be, yeah. I don't know if it's the most productive use of, of my time. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, but actually as far as, you know, if you were, if you were next door right now, I'd obviously would rather do this podcast like face to face rather than rather than over skype through webcam and stuff so you know i think it's kind of uh i think it's absolutely better to meet face to face but i think oftentimes the uh the what would be the I don't know, externalities associated with it just might not necessarily be justified in my mind yeah yeah i mean we take into account the the travel the time the expenses although i like traveling i like being on the plane i feel like all these things come unlocked on the plane when I can't move and the, all these subconscious things come up to the active guy. It's uh, kind of cool there. But yeah, I mean the traveling part, if you, if maybe if you want to, if you look at it as a way of, I get to go there, I get to see Russia, have a good time there, maybe see more people. If you try to stack meetings or stack interactions, so it's not just, I go to meet with one company or one group of people. It's why well, I can meet with five groups of people. I can meet with maybe 10 groups of people. Then I feel like you, you have more of a incentive in your mind to then make that, make that actual physical trip out there. So it could be like a, a something to think about too is if you go to Sochi, maybe you try to meet up with more, I don't know, maybe there's a Russian affiliate out there, man. Maybe there's there's VKRU, I don't know. I, don't, I think that's a site, I think it's like a Facebook of there, but I don't know, it could be something to kind of, a way to approach it. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with what you're saying that oftentimes trying to, uh, to tie a few things in together makes everything more worthwhile. Yeah. All right, guys. So give me give me one or two questions here, and then uh, we're gonna wrap things up. I got to get in the pool. Jeff Brock says, "Joey, are you staying in line while relocating to Vegas?" Yes. Um, Bruno says, "Could you ask Mike how he sees poker shares in five years?" Okay. What do you think? Uh, so I would guess poker shares in five years will have a lot. I I think po- the my my vision for poker shares is to have strong enough partnerships with all organizers that effectively in-game betting is a part of poker basically you know i think that i think that is sort of that is sort of one of the dreams where it's when when a final table is going on at all stages you know any viewer can be like okay i'm gonna buy this guy okay this guy's playing bad the odds are you know shifting against him this guy's losing his momentum betting against that guy. like i think i think that that like right now 
where you know that would be you know first of all our platform isn't fast enough to handle that um and then we also don't really have the uh we have sort of a disconnect between okay so the tournament goes on net here like goes on and then 30 minutes later it's displayed you know right now poker shares is on the level of the player base like we hear what's going on 30 minutes after it happens unless we have someone in the stands or whatnot but like you know the the idea five years from now would be that we are in close enough uh we're in you know in a close enough spot with all the organizers of all the major events that we're we're getting the feed to make odds as it goes on um which i think would be uh pretty enticing and i think for organizers basically we think that sports betting has made sporting events more popular dfs has made sporting more popular and we think that basically building building poker shares into that platform where uh, users are just constantly engaged because they're financially incentivized to do so, I think is, would be one of the best things that can happen for the poker world. And I think that we, uh, I think that would be the direction we want to trend towards. Uh, I guess, I guess this is kind of maybe in a way related to that is Mike getting streamlined data from large tournament operators to cut back on fraud. Uh, what exactly does he mean by that? Mm, I don't know. I thought, hoping you would know what that meant, Mike. I don't know what that okay. means. I mean, getting streamlined day for large time. I I don't know. Maybe the thirty minute thing. I, it's kind of what I what I took it to meant, but not one hundred percent positive on that. Is Poker Shares available in Australia? Yes. Okay. Uh, does Poker Shares accept Bitcoin from my boy Max Ernst? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, does Mike have any thoughts on the vloggers, Trooper, Nimi? Kraut, Bosky, Owen. I have no idea what that is referring to. Okay, Sven says, ask Mike if he's still studying poker, if he still studies poker, please, Poppy. Uh, sadly, no. <laughs> I mean, there's, there are times, like I'm still in multiple strategy chats. I kind of, you know, skim them and whatnot, but really uh, I haven't, I haven't, I would, I would say my poker game is, is getting worse while everyone else's is getting better uh which in some ways can be fun like when i was when i was playing uh when i was playing that high roller that i won in montreal i was just pure field player the whole the whole time uh and just really really having a good time with it like there was there was one hand where it's just like i don't know a guy raised i called i flopped a pair i checked he bet i just felt like he had a, a hand and then folded a pair to a c bet and heads up no limit and i just like i would never you know i would never do that and it wasn't some super coordinated board or anything i just felt like oh this guy probably has a better hand than me um and i've just been doing i've been doing a lot more of that when i'm playing against guys that i think i feel like i have a good handle on their games live uh I'm, and i'm less thinking you know i'm less sort of focused on the long term I'm more just like, oh, I just want to make the right decision now and not worry too much about how exploitable I am because I'm not going to be playing with these guys that much more. So I'm largely, I have, a, I mean, I still have, you know, a ton of experience playing poker, which I, you know, remember most of, but I, I definitely have a lot of sort of fun player attitudes when I play. Hmm. Uh, Gus clarified by saying, say someone enters a tournament and then claims they didn't, so they bust and have action on themselves. Oh yeah, so uh, so basically, we take on uh, effectively like a guilty until proven innocent mentality, um, where basically we like if if someone can prove that they didn't play, uh, we give the like we say okay you know you you didn't play we give you a refund but by we don't we don't by default give refunds um, or we get we, we it's it's really easy for online tournaments where you just sort search through figure out who did and didn't play. And we have we have data feeds from some of the sites where we can actually just like plug it into a script and determine. Uh, but for, yeah, for live events, it's just uh, guilty until proving innocent. So, uh, you know, if you go and buy yourself, like we'll, we need uh, decent proof as to you not playing. Like it could be whatever, um, uh, let's say uh, a, f a, flight, a flight ticket that you took while the tournament was going on, or it could be 
um, getting CC'd on an email from the casino that shows your play history at that casino or whatever it happens to be. We need proof that you didn't play rather than proof that you did play. Max also said, "Tell thank you, Joey. Tell Mike that Beep needs to stop looking for that treasure, by the way. See a few people dying there every few weeks. Uh, I, yeah, I, so, so Max Ernst, he's talking about my friend Jay Rayner on the treasure hunt. Uh, Jay lost that bet. Uh, I gave him 30 to 1 odds, my 45 Bitcoin to his 1.5 Bitcoin on whether he could find uh, Fenn's treasure. Uh, he was unsuccessful. So uh, he's, Ooh, he's off. He's off. Treasure? Fenn's? Uh, his name's Forrest Fenn. He's like some he's some like super successful art dealer from the states who basically hit a big treasure worth several million dollars, made a big riddle on how to find it, and there's been like thousands of people searching for it. And my buddy got so convinced he knew where it was that he wanted to bet that he could find it. If he so he yeah he flew out to fucking I th I think it was like Yellowstone National Park or something like that. Flew out there, hunted around, treasure hunting in Yellowstone for a little bit. He met the guy who hit it. Like his buddy, like interviewed him. They talked for a little bit. Got to got to kind of know the guy. Became fairly friendly. Searched around for the treasure a bunch, and then ultimately came up unsuccessful. Okay, uh, I, IFPZ, IFP skate. Are you so small, or is the doormat so grande? What's this he's talking about? Are you so small, or is the doormat next to you so grande? Um, I would say probably, probably neither. I think it might just be that my monitor is very high, so I'm further from the monitor. So the ratio of distance from me to the monitor would be bigger. Like I'm, uh, I would say I'm pretty normal size, and that door. I guess the doormat. Yeah, you know, it's pretty normal size as well. So I would say neither. Okay. Okay. Good question. I like that one. Uh, this, Randall Trap, this guy must be the biggest troll ever. How do they know he actually hit something? That's true. How do they know this guy actually legitimately hit something? And this guy could, could be contributing to the death of people trying to search for this treasure. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it's super likely that either he didn't ever hide a treasure or that someone else found the treasure and just kept it and didn't go public about finding it. Uh, so, so yeah, I, I mean, I love my side of the bet where, you know, I have no idea what the number is, but if I were to guess, maybe 25% chance that there is a treasure out there, <laughs> like, right. you know, yeah, I, I would, I would guess like 75% either he didn't hide it or someone found it. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm much more of a pessimistic guy and my buddy Jay is much more of an optimistic guy. And I think that's where, our, uh, why the bet came about. Hmm. Andrew Dopker says, best golf score. <laughs> 101. I'm not much of a golfer. Yeah, that's not very good. Um, although I, I'm not that good either. Noob Neil says, ask Mike about his favorite document documentaries and or books, ones that inspired him. Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I don't watch a ton, uh, a ton of documentaries. Um, yeah, uh, I just don't. I just don't watch a ton of documentaries. I don't really. I don't really know why. Um, as far as as far as books, um, I really liked uh, "Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman." Uh, that would be that would be probably one of my favorite books. Um, it's an autobiography by uh, Richard Feynman. Um, I really enjoyed that. I liked. What are some other ones that were? They were pretty, uh, pretty useful. I, I just recently, one book I read recently that was, I thought was pretty good is I read, uh, four reasonable men. Uh, it's a book about sort of four, four different philosophers with very differing views and the author who's a philosopher himself kind of tying, tying their mentalities and views and lifestyles into what he thought were sort of the similarities and differences between them. It was kind of uh, it's kind of nice to read sort of like four biographies in one without getting too uh, in depth. I like that a fair bit. Um, I'm I, on the spot. I can't think too much. Like the last two years, I haven't been doing that much reading. Um, largely just kind of setting up the business, not having a ton of free time. I've been reading less than I normally do. So if if maybe after the podcast, I could think of you know five or ten more books that I really recommend. But off uh, off the top of my head, I don't have I don't have a ton of recommendations. 
All right, last one we're going to get to here. Camellia, Carmelian says, online rake is messing up games like heads up, Nolan and Hold'em, and pop, let me know, Maha. Do you think poker shares can run cross books and props to help players avoid the rake issues? Um... I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we can, we could try doing that. Uh, I mean, the one thing is, so basically with, with every single person we, we deal with, you know, you, you effectively, you know, you're not just thinking about the odds. You're also thinking about the tendencies of the betters basically. So if there's someone we have an established history of gambling with our, our trust for them is much larger than someone who just comes to the site. So, you know, if someone just, if someone just comes to the site tomorrow and they think, okay, I want to cross book in cash games or something like that, most likely we're going to be substantially minus EV there because we push pretty thin margins. If we have the best of it, we're winning by a few percent. If we have the worst of it, we're losing by several hundred percent because the chip dumping. Um, so basically we really, uh, we really need to be cautious. Like we're effectively laying a massive, massive price if we're if we're allowing cash game cross books, um, so I think that we we really need to we need to know someone and like trust them so much to allow people to cross book in heads up or short handed cash games. So I think I think I mean basically in in theory we'll do it. You know, there's there's probably you know a dozen guys I trust enough that I allow them to, but that's never going to become a big part of our business model because I just think that. I think that most people, um, or I shouldn't say most people, I think enough people would take advantage of that, that it's very minus CB for us. Yeah, it makes sense. It seems like that's a very easy thing to potentially cheat on with, I mean, chip dump. Yeah, I know. it just seems like way too easy to, to, to do something out of line and, uh, and you guys put yourself at a pretty big disadvantage for sure. Yeah, yeah, it's very, uh, it's very tough to come out on top in that situation. Yeah. Uh, Brian S. Saw Mike was looking for big free Mayweather action. His your thoughts on the fight line? Um, so my my thoughts were my thoughts were a little better yesterday than they were today. Um, they were they were supposed to be fighting with ten ounce gloves, and they re if basically Floyd said he'll fight with eight ounce gloves uh, this morning, um, which is you know getting getting closer to what uh, Connor's used to and further from what he's used to. I mean, I still I mean I'm I'm still looking to bet Mayweather, but you know. The the chances the chance of a knockout just went up. The you know Connor's familiarity with what's going on just went up. Uh, so I think that you know I still I'm still on Team Mayweather, but a little bit less so than I'd have been a few days ago. Mm. Uh, but yeah, it's it's one of those things where I yeah I want to I want to be able to bet a decent amount on this. But it's it's kind of it's kind of funny. Like basically as as when you're sort of involved with a gambling business, you see how much of your upside is limited by people's inability to get money on the site and you just get sort of you know you get kind of frustrated and we just think like oh wow you know if we if everything just worked like if everyone who wanted to use our site could use our site we'd have several times more action and so i'm kind of thinking man this is so annoying and then i go trying to you know make accounts on various on various sports books and stuff like that and run into the exact same issues from from the other side of the coin, basically, yeah. where where I'm seeing like, oh wow, like even the big businesses, you know, even Pinnacle, Bet365, Matchbook, all these guys, they have to put up with the same shit that we have to put up with, basically. And it's it's sort of it's sort of funny when you're when you're a you know big fish or or when you're a uh, <laughs> I, this is a terrible analogy, but when you're a small fish in a big pond, the the big fish in that in that pond still have the same issues, I guess. Like it was, it's been kind of like I was I was frustrated for a sec, and then I was just like, wait a sec, this is the same frustration that our user base will feel when using our site. It's just it's just an inevitability that sort of uh, you know that KYC and AML regulations prevent people from being able to bet as much as they'd like to. Um, so yeah, it's just kind of, uh, kind of just, uh, one of the ongoing issues in the gambling industry. Never make it easy, Poppy. They never make it easy. They I know. It, Do you have any thoughts it. on that? Uh, which part about, about the Mayweather fight? Yeah. I don't know, man. I think, I think, I don't see how Mayweather doesn't, doesn't win, but it does seem like McGregor could get that, that lucky knockout punch. Everybody I talk to says, there's no fucking chance he wins, but 
I don't know if I was gonna bet, I would definitely bet on Mayweather's side. But I don't know, man. I'm not a big like sports sports gambler anyway, so I don't want I don't want this to be the time I decide to go crazy in Las Vegas and start betting on a bunch of sports. So I'm kind of I'm trying to stay away from that stuff, Mike. I know I know where my 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 tendencies can go too fast if I if they get out of line. So yeah, no, I I definitely know where you're coming from, and it's also something you know. Boxing is just so corrupt. <laughs> like, there's there's so much there's so much room. For it to just be that you know Floyd's taking a dive and he knows he's losing this and he's getting getting an extra couple hundred million dollars from sports betters if he takes a dive like there's there's a lot of room for this to be really you know a very out of line dealing <laughs> so you know well I mean I'm going to I want to bet on this but uh, I don't want to uh, yeah similar to you I don't want to get too out of line basically yeah I, I mean that's that's certainly a huge thing is because the corruption aspect of things and. I haven't heard anything from anybody really smart about, you know, having to worry as much about that in this particular instance. I think with his undefeated record, you know, all of a sudden going forty nine and one for the next what thirty years, he might be alive. You know, and it's not even if you make a couple extra hundred million dollars. Would you rather say, you know, your legacy fifty and zero, or never been defeated, or would you rather say that you're fifty and one, but you made an extra couple extra hundred million dollars potentially on that rematch, and off of whatever you might have made. From people bet like the, the the whatever bet you have set up if that's the, if that's the situation. So yeah, I mean, I what, know, you say about, I mean what you say about the extra couple hundred million? Uh, I don't know too much about this, but I've heard he's I've heard he owes money to the IRS right now. Like I think he might not yeah. be yeah might not be in such good financial shape to where you know the uh, the the money uh, might be more of an incentive to him than than we would like to think. So yeah. yeah you You'd think he'd make enough just from this fight alone, but when you factor in the fight alone and then potentially the side bets, if that was the case, and then the rematch that comes down the road, it, it you know what? It's yeah, really, you, you got taxes, you know, you got to buy some more cars, you got to take some pictures with your, you know, bricks and millions of dollars. Like, you know, the next thing you know, it's all gone. Like, you know, it's, it's like that South Park episode, like, you know, diversify across this, blah, 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 and it's gone. Yeah, I think, I think that's uh, there's some there's some room for that. You never know. You can go fast, man. Where's uh people if they want to find you, Mike? How's the Instagram coming? You've been doing a lot more Instagramming. Not too much. I'd say there was a time when I was grinding the Instagram pretty hard. Now I'd maybe put up maybe three pictures a month, maybe a little bit more than that or something. But yeah, my inst my most forms of social media, Mike McDonald eight nine. Uh, someone someone took Mike McDonald eight nine on Instagram. And they put up pictures of Ludovic Gaelic. Like it's not, it's not, it's not Ludovic Gaelic's account, and the account's inactive. But yeah, someone has Mike McDonald eight nine and pictures of Ludovic Gaelic. I'm Mike McDonald underscore eight nine on Instagram. Uh, okay. If you want to find me there, and then uh, and then obviously you know through Poker Shares is where where like PokerShares.com is where a lot of our our content will be. We also I didn't mention this earlier. We released our blog recently, and we're nice. kind of using. We want this to be. We want our site to kind of turn into, you know, kind of a a page that people want to visit, even if they aren't gambling. Like just something to constantly, you know, right now our content it's pretty surface level, but as as more and more things happen, we want to have, uh, you know, just more articles that are kind of, you know, interesting, fast paced, like the exciting stuff going on in the industry, so that we're one of people's uh, go to like gateways for poker content. Cool. I think that would be would be a great thing to have. Any any more good poker content written being put out there, I think is is good for everybody. So excited that's, uh, for that, that's the goal. Uh, all right, man, that's what we got here, guys. In the chat, make sure you guys like the podcast on YouTube because if you do, I think that's supposed to be good for me. I don't know. Leave a comment. Let me know what you thought. Hit us up on Twitter at Joinger One at Mike McDonald eighty nine. Hit us up on Instagram at Poppy. GTO at Mike, Mike underscore McDonald 89. And uh, that's what we got, man. I appreciate, as always, Mike, for coming on. It's always, uh, it's always a very fun episode to talk with you, catch up with you. And we'll probably do it again in the near future. Good luck on the stream boat. And good luck on the action you have in the prop bet of me swimming a mile in the open ocean. You're going to crush uh, it. You, you, just, you, don't, you don't even need luck. You're, you're going to crush this one, man. I feel good. I feel good. I'm, I'm actually, I'm probably going to hop in the pool and, uh, and get after some things. So guys in the chat, appreciate everybody for tuning in. Appreciate all the comments, questions back. 
Friday, Kelly, World War Winter Halter. That'll be back on the podcast. And then next Wednesday, Kevin Martin. Guys, adios. Peace out. Much love. See everybody.